Here's the 30 second lesson on what legends know. Never practice nunchucks in a crowded room. Never eat chole before a road trip. Always take your shirt off before you iron it. Don't take a call near a swimming pool. And don't forget, saving is not investing. Legends don't just save, they invest in mutual funds. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully. Divyastra is the theme of today's Cut the Clutter. It gives us a break from politics. This is the heavy political season. In the middle of this, while the Prime Minister is today watching the firepower demonstration of armed forces, this is the backdrop to this has come from the successful test of Agni-5. Now, Agni-5 is a missile that is a, it's an intermediate range missile which has been in service with Indian Armed Forces. So what's new with this one? This Agni-5 is the longest range yet, definitely 5000 kilometers plus. Now what happens with range is that as ranges are defined, once you go above 5500, up to 5500 is intermediate range ballistic missile. Once you go above 5500, credibly, it becomes like an ICBM. An ICBM does not have to be 12,000 kilometers, any, anything beyond 5500. So Agni-5, the basic missile, which was tested successfully in 2012, that is 12 years ago, has definitely been in service for at least two to three years, most likely three years already. This version, one, it is the most advanced version. Also, it has done the longest distance. It has the longest range. Definitely in the 5000 to 5500 kilometer ballpark. That's why the note to airmen and marines, no time as it's called, that India issued before this test in the, in the Bay of Bengal, that covered a very wide region and very long distance. So that itself gave us an idea of how significant this is in terms of range. In fact, in fact, strategic affairs expert Brahma Chalani, who we know very well, he had tweeted when this no time was issued, underlining the significance of this test. Please see that tweet on your screens. Now, the other distinctive thing or new thing about this version of Agni. Agni has been there for more than three decades now. The first version was tested more than three decades ago and I will give you, I will give you a listing of all that as we go along. But the difference this time is that this is an Agni with a Marving capability. Marving we explained to you yesterday also. Marving is, Marving is multiple independently targeted re-entry vehicles. Multiple Multiple like five warheads going, going, going up, independently targeted. So each one can go to different target and re-entry because these come back. So like all ballistic missiles, they go up, exit the atmosphere, then make an entry back. That's why re-entry. So easy to understand. Also, Mervin technology is not new. In fact, the Americans first successfully tested and then deployed. They carried out testing in late 60s. They deployed the first Marving missiles in 1970. By 1971, they had also deployed a satellite launched Marving ballistic missile. So these technologies are not new. But remember, very few countries have these technologies because those that have these technologies, then they, they go the extra mile to deny it to all of the rest. Now, many countries in the world have nuclear weapons capability informally as well. The Israelis have it. We don't know what the Israelis have by way of missiles. The North Koreans have it. They have pretty good missiles and a lot. And how good those missiles are, you can see every time the Pakistanis carry out a test because at least on the Indian side, we watch Pakistan's tests much more closely or India can watch Pakistan's tests much more closely than North Korea's tests. But whatever North Korea has, at some point, India has to presume the Pakistanis will also have because that is China's way of keeping the balance between India and Pakistan, keeping India triangulated with Pakistan. Nevertheless, this is our first Marving missile. This is the first Marving missile. We don't know how many warheads it had. Now, there are some statements from sources in DRDO. I also read something that Dr. V.K. Saraswat, former head of DRDO, then member of Niti Ayog, 
Also, somebody who's featured on Walk the Talk long past when he used to be the head of DRDO. In fact, we recorded with him in the DRDO complex uh, in Delhi, in the DRDO head headquarters. He's indicated that this could be a bunch of warheads without exactly naming the number, but not a large number, not like 10 or a dozen that some of the merving ICBMs of America, Russia, America, as I told you, started in 1970. They deployed an SLBM in 1971, Murming SLBM in 1971. By the end of the 70s, the Soviets had matched up and in the course of time, the Chinese also eventually did. And the Pakistanis claimed last October with a test, the test of a missile that they call Ababil. Ababil actually is a Quranic mythical bird which is supposed to have come in to defend the Kaaba in 570 AD, the year the Prophet was born. That year, Kaaba apparently was under attack by, by a ruler, by a local ruler who had an army that included an elephant cavalry, right? In the, in the Arabia, an elephant cavalry, but that, that's how the story goes. And he was coming in to destroy the Kaaba when these mythical birds emerged from nowhere and started hitting those elephants and that army with raining, raining on them deadly stones and so defeated the army. So Ababil is the name that the Pakistanis have chosen for their version of what they called as a Merving missile. However, as you would expect, the range of that missile is much shorter. Pakistani sites only go as far as the most distant parts of India. They want to cover every part of India. And once again, the Pakistanis don't have to research on their missiles very much. They get them. In the past, they got those from China, the first ones they got from China. And since then, China has made sure through, through Mili Bhagat that North Koreans keep transferring to Pakistan, whatever the Pakistanis need. So they pretty much keep abreast of India. However, India's burden in this case or India's concern in this case is not so much Pakistan. Pakistan, if you really wanted to send them compliments on a nuclear, uh, return on a nuclear weapon, you could send them by maybe, maybe by DHL or maybe you could ha have them or maybe you could have them delivered by Dunzo or Zomato or something. It's so close by I'm exaggerating and, and using facetious language. But the fact is that everything in Pakistan is available within a short range from India. Even the Prithvi kind of range will hit almost everything that matters in Pakistan. So that is not the issue. India's attention has to be on China. Because remember, what's a nuclear weapon? A nuclear weapon is the weapon of the losing side. No matter what you say, India has a no first use pledge, which means unless somebody uses a weapon of mass destruction against us, we will not use it. It's a written and declared no first use policy. But at the same time, it says that if somebody uses weapons of mass destruction on us, which is not confined, that definition is not confined to nuclear weapons, can be biological weapons, can, can be chemical weapons, then India's response will be massive and disproportionate. You can't think that I land one punch and the other side will land one punch or two punches. The other side, in this case, India says, we will then destroy you. We'll hit you with everything we've got. It's for that situation that India needs a Marvin kind of missile because once you get into this race, you cannot draw the line and you say, I have enough. Now on numbers, there's been a debate. There's been a debate and that debate was led by Dr. K. Subramaniam, the father of our current external affairs minister and General Sundarji, a former army chief, who used to say more is not necessary when less is enough. That with nuclear weapons, you don't necessarily need so many hundreds because even if you can land a few, that's good enough. You're, but at the same time, the few that you have, have to be credible, have to be trustworthy that if you fire one, it will actually go and detonate. You can't have a nuclear weapon that goes a dud. It will hit the target. It has to be accurate. Then it should be credible. Your deterrence has to be credible in the sense that it's spread out. Your adversary cannot hit and take out your nuclear assets first. And when you say spread out, then you have to be spreading it out in air, spreading it out on the ground in various, various parts of the country, in secure places, underground or otherwise, have it on airborne platforms, aircraft, and also have it at sea. Essentially, 
in submarines. That is called the triad of nuclear deterrence. And that is what India has been working on. And that's why you see stories occasionally of this of this project being being implemented in Vizac, where the new submarines which will become India's active SSBNs, nuclear weapon carrying submarines, not just nuclear, nuclear powered submarines, but nuclear weapon carrying nuclear powered submarines, the Sagrika project that's going on there. This missile test fits into that larger picture. So this missile, what is it that's new about this missile? One, I told you the range. It's about 5,500, 600. It can be extended, I believe, to 7,000. We don't know about that, as much about that, but no adversary will take it lightly. No adversary will not work on the presumption that this missile has that kind of range. And that would mean that every part of China will be covered by this missile being fired from almost anywhere in India. Now, it's not something that you're looking forward to doing. Nobody is looking forward to using a nuclear weapon system. At the same time, for a deterrence to be effective, it has to look like something that you could really use. And if you could, if you used it, it will be really effective. Otherwise, a deterrent doesn't work. So how did this journey start? How did India's missile journey start? I might have had the privilege of having covered the first months, even the first years of it. So 1983, July 26, 1983 is when the Integrated Guided Missile Development Program was launched. Then the Dadas of DRDO and Defense Research were there, based Arunachalam, Dr. Kalam was then chosen to head this project, he wasn't the senior most in the system at that point. Dr. B.S. Arunachalam, who recently passed away, he was the head of DRDO and also scientific advisor to Raksha Mantri at that point. And that's when this program was visualized. India started working on missiles much earlier. In 1958, for example, Snehesh Alex Philip tells me, DRDO set up a team called SWDT, SWDT as in Special Weapon Development Team. That did, then morphed into DRDL and it was then located at Defense Science Center in Delhi, sort of in North Delhi. You can see it if you're driving past uh, on GT Road towards, say, uh, Haryana and Punjab. You can see, see on the left, there is a big Defense Science Center. From there, it shifted to Hyderabad in 1962. That's where I first ended up visiting the lab in 1984, if I remember correctly, while I worked for India Today. And that's when you saw the models of Prithvi and others being worked at. And that's where there was a larger model of something called Agni or something that became Agni. So these missiles were visualized around that time in 1972 also, because the idea of missiles was always there. And the fact is that Pakistan had beaten India in the basic missile race in the subcontinent. In 1965 war, Pakistan aircraft, fighter aircraft had air-to-air -air missiles. India still had one MiG, its first MiG, MiG squadron forming up. I, I think only nine aircraft had come. So they had some kind of missiles, but early era missiles and not yet operational. Pakistanis, on the other hand, their F-104 star fighters, F-86 Sabres, they were fully missile capable. Even anti-tank missiles, the Pakistanis got first. India at that point had a disadvantage because India did not have a Western source of this weaponry. And with the Soviet Union, Indian relationship only built up post the 1965 war. The MiG agreement was signed earlier, but larger supplies started coming in only from late 1960s onwards. So in 1972, DRDO set up another project called Project Devil and that that was to develop surface to surface missiles because by that time the big powers were already deploying Merving intercontinental ballistic missiles. For us, for my generation, that is the stuff that we saw in movies and that is the stuff we read about in sort of Cold War, Cold War era thrillers. There was a genre like that and it was quite exciting. The only thing is you never imagine that your country could be doing some of this. Now, because of these early efforts, that is SWDT and Project Devil, some basic facilities had been built up at the lab in Hyderabad. Basic facilities, test beds, fuel research, etc. That had been done. So by the time IGMDP or Integrated Guided Missile Development Program was 
instituted in 1983, a lot of the basic samagri was available. So the first success of this program was the Prithvi, which was just about 150 to 500 kilometers. The initial ones, liquid fuel, very cumbersome to carry. But even then, Dr. Kalam said, and I think it's quoted somewhere in one of my India Today stories, he said, this is the most accurate missile you can get in this range for love or money, right? So that missile came in. India had its, lo and behold, India had its first ballistic missile, something that India could not have imagined. Now, you can always say that Pakistan always stayed ahead, but that's because Pakistan had a source, in that case, China, which was quite willing to cut the corners on nuclear pro proliferation as well as missile pro proliferation. Also, although there are international treaties on both missiles, particularly missile technology control regime, but the Chinese always walked around it by calling something, by describing something as maybe 10 kilometers of shorter range than, than the cutoff in MTCR, etc. So the Chinese gave Pakistan plenty. Pakistan, that's how the Pakistanis stay, stayed quite ahead and India was having to do catch up. Now that catch up is over simply because the ranges required for Pakistan are, are not that long. That catch up is now over and India is now able to focus on the Chinese. Now see how this program is developed. Agni-1 was tested in 1983. That was a very basic missile. Say about range was claimed to be 700 kilometers, but it was more a technology demonstrator. At least that's how we covered it at that point. Agni-2 came up in 1999. This had a longer range, could be 2000 to 2500 kilometer range, which would cover almost one third of China, a Chinese mainland from some place where it could be based credibly, safely in India. Agni 3 then came up, which was 3500 kilometer range. This was the first of the two stage missiles in the Agni series. Two stage means the rocket takes the weapon up or the warload up and then after taking it to some distance, propelling it to some distance, but one stage falls off. So you have fuel left in the second stage to carry it further. So two stage rockets by definition would travel longer. The rocket fired just now, Agni 5, the latest version, Agni 5 or Devyastra as it's been renamed, that is a three stage rocket. So that's also, also a difference. Agni 4 then came up. Agni 4 came up with Again, a claimed 4,000 kilometer range. Again, about one ton of warhead. One ton of warhead doesn't mean it's TNT. One ton of warhead which has a nuclear weapon in it. So it can deliver quite a bit of punch, maybe 20 kilotons, maybe 30 kilotons, depending on how good your warhead making is. This also had another capability. It was also lighter and it, would be, it could be carried on a mobile launcher. What a mobile launcher does is, it also enhances the safety of your nuclear assets because the enemy in the course of time will find out where your permanent, permanent locations are because everybody has eyes and ears everywhere, particularly in, uh, in outer space and in the sky. So they'll pick it up. That's why for a credible deterrence, you also have to have your deterrent in mobility. Ideally in constant mobility. So nobody is able to figure out zero in an any point of time, nobody should be able to feel confident at any point of time that they've taken out all of your adversaries, nuclear weapon systems. You can take out 99 out of 100, but even if one remains, it will deliver a crippling blow on you, at least a blow that you will not find acceptable. Then came Agni 5. Agni 5, as we told you earlier, the first was tested in 2012. Couple of, couple of years ago, in December 22, DRDO also tested the nighttime capabilities of Agni 5. Nighttime is, and missile doesn't bother whether it's daytime or nighttime, but it's the launch where I, where you are launching from. Whatever other factors a nighttime launch and strike involves, that was also tested because, you know, God forbid, if a country does decide to use a system like this, one, it will be done in a very desperate and difficult situation. Weapon of last resort. Second, anybody using nuclear weapons knows that there will be a retaliation. There will be a retaliation and there will be massive mutually assured destruction. The last thing you want in such a situation is 
you firing a weapon and it not working out and it failing so that's why these tests are so vital now the current lot of work work is on on a new version of agni prime this agni prime is much lighter i believe it can also be canisterized which means it's almost like it's a bad example it's a it, it's a it's an overly simplistic example it's like on a ship you bring several goods stored here and there it used to be the case in the past or put them all in one container and then you can take off those containers put them on a truck or put them on a train and take them anywhere that is basically what it means to canisterize a missile a canisterized missile is easier to carry easier to transport it's easier to prepare to fire and can carry its own a lot of its own launching aiming directing electronics equipment and the other tam jam with it that's how it enhances the country's deterrent capability the and the other thing about agni prime is and we'll see uh, as the story unfolds that unlike other ballistic missiles it can also be maneuvered mid flight right if it's maneuvered mid flight it makes it that much tougher for the defender look if you fire a missile and the defender is able to block it we've now seen in ukraine that missiles are not that difficult to block almost 85 to 90% of all the missiles fired by the russians at ukraine 85 to 90% have been intercepted at some place so modern missile interception is very good and russians have used some of their best and the fastest missiles kinjal for example and many of them also get intercepted with patriot systems other systems so missile defense also has improved greatly what the marvink system does is because you have different warheads going in different directions at different speeds sometimes you might also program it in such a way that all the warheads come back take their time come back and strike the same place so this is to overwhelm the anti missile defenses overwhelm the anti missile defenses and when the strike does get delivered pulverize the defender that is the idea in that situation to have a missile which can be maneuvered mid flight has its own advantages because the defender gets to know as soon as you launch a missile there are no secrets about it about it a missile like like agni 5 to reach any credible target in china will take about 20 minutes that's a lot of time in this business for the defender to prepare and launch their own defense maybe maybe even launch a counter strike in that case to have the capability of mid flight maneuverability to avoid any missile defenses also becomes a plus now i told you that deterrence only works if it's credible see russians they have credible deterrence at the same time deterrence is almost never used that's the reason since hiroshima and nagasaki nuclear nuclear weapons have never been used but when when a side has it sometimes it can be used also sometimes it's it can be used as a hedge like saying look this is my red line you come beyond it i might do anything or sometimes like india says if you use wmds against me i will use them against you but in a disproportionate way sometimes it can be used for nuclear blackmail blackmail as well the pakistanis used it as nuclear blackmail with us in india 1990 summer of 1990 when they said they were going to start a war with a nuclear attack and that's when india did not have a credible deterrence and bp singh's government at that point panicked that's a story that's been well documented books have been written, written books have been written about it simur harsh has written a very long article about this that's a that's a confirmed thing that is something that mr gujral ik gujral who was then foreign minister also confirmed in his memoirs and also in his interviews because he dealt with it at the indian end this warning had come from his pakistani counterpart saib zada yakub khan that done we recently saw and that's the story that david sanger broke in the new york times we recently saw the russians use the same nuclear blackmail as well when through their chatter etc electronic chatter they scared the americans they alarmed the americans sufficiently into believing that they will use they might use a tactical low strength tactical nu- nuclear weapon against ukrainian army concentrations in their ongoing war this was around time last october when they were really doing badly on the ground and that was the high point of the ukrainian armed forces in their defense of their country and at that point the story came out if you re- read that david sanger story and the follow up on cnn it also says 
that Joe Biden then reached out to Xi Jinping and Narendra Modi to try and try and counsel Putin not to do any such thing. But you see, what is the fallout? I'm deliberately using that term. The fallout of this nuclear blackmail is that the Americans have been even more careful not to give the Ukrainians any weapon systems which they could use to strike deeper inside Russia or or with which they could cause such damage to, to, to the Russian military effort or Russian installations or Russian assets that would then again give Putin the excuse or maybe send Putin into panic into using something nuclear because what happens is when somebody uses something nuclear no matter what the strength there has to be a retaliation there will be a retaliation and then you don't know that cycle will take you so once again this is a case of nuclear weapons serving as a deterrent even if as even if in terms of a blackmail